from Paul to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love Him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, and for Jesus, the light of the world, thanks be to God. If you attend church for any length of time, you will encounter the Apostle Paul. His influence looms large over the early formative years of Christianity. Paul was not one of the twelve disciples who followed Jesus in his earthly ministry, but he became a leader soon after Jesus ascended into heaven. He was instrumental in spreading the message of Jesus across the eastern Mediterranean, winning converts, and founding churches in Syria, Turkey, and Greece. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, 13 are letters ascribed to Paul, written to churches and individuals. His letters are the oldest documents in the New Testament, predating the gospel by several years. His teachings on faith and grace, on the work of Jesus on the cross, and his advice on maintaining Christian unity has informed the continuing development of the church down to the present day. Someone this important, predictably, has attracted a, his share of admirers. More to the point, they like to talk about his strong convictions, his relentless energy in sharing the gospel, his willingness to bring Gentiles, non-Jewish people, into the faith without requiring observance of the Jewish law, which was a real game changer. But he also has a long list of detractors. Paul has been criticized for his perceived arrogance, insisting on his own way when it's sometimes just a matter of taste. Some feel that he was dismissive of the place of women in the church and too accepting of cultural moral norms. Even in his own time, he faced constant challenges to his authority to serve as a leader in the church. So for those who know Paul as this feisty, opinionated firebrand, these words from his letter to the church Christians in Corinth seem out of place, as if he's talking about somebody else. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with lofty words or wisdom, but in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Who is this person? What have they done with Paul? Well, you can see why Paul's claims of not being a good public speaker could be met with some skepticism. One has to wonder if this might be an attempt at false humility. After all, this is the great evangelist we're talking about, the man who witnesses before kings who risk his life on a regular basis for the sake of the gospel. Why would he be so fearful to preach to the Corinthians? Or maybe he's struggling with feelings of inferiority. He acknowledges that he has at least some ability, but he's no Apollos, no great orator who can hold an audience spellbound for hours. Or maybe he's just self-aware enough to know that he has a problem staying focused. If he spoke the same way that he writes his letters, we know that he could ramble, 
chasing tangents down bunny trails. Now, where was I? But in this case, Paul is downplaying his role in delivering the gospel message to the Corinthians because he wants to keep the focus on the message itself. Let's remember that we're in chapter 2 of what will be 16 chapters. We're still in the introduction, if you would. Paul is writing this letter from across the Aegean Sea in Ephesus. Recently, emissaries from Corinth had traveled to see him, asking his advice about a number of issues that have arisen in the congregation. And at the core of their problems, it seems, is that everyone has begun looking after their own interest instead of the mission at the church. They're arguing over who is more spiritual, who is the most morally pure, who gets to sit in places of honor, and who has to take the lowest seats. As Paul contemplates all this jockeying for position, all these self-serving attitudes, he realizes that if he's going to help them, he's going to have to get back to basics. When I first came to you, Paul writes, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's interesting that this is where Paul places the emphasis in his preaching. You could argue that if you were trying to win converts to follow Jesus, you might want to lead with his teachings or the way that he welcomed the outcast, or his healings and miracles. But to draw attention to the shameful way that he died? Why would anyone want to follow somebody that ended up like that? In fact, Paul has already acknowledged that most people would call that foolishness. We expect our Messiahs to ride in on a white stallion, not to be born in poverty in a barn. We want our saviors at the head of a powerful army, not telling his disciples to put away their swords. We want our heroes enthroned in splendor, not dying in public humiliation as a condemned criminal. This makes no sense, unless, unless we're willing to consider that in Christ, God is showing us a new way to live. On the cross, we see the lengths that God will go to demonstrate the depths of God's love. On the cross, it's not God's wrath we see on display. It's our own willingness to resort to violence to address our problems, even if it means killing the innocent. On the cross, Jesus opens up to the transcendent, the reality that lies beyond what we can experience with our senses, filling our lives with meaning and hope. Rather than the cross being scandalous, Paul understands that it is the wisdom of God. It's certainly counterintuitive, isn't it? But its sheer audacity is what makes us take a closer look. Jesus emptied himself so that we could be filled with the glory of God. Jesus voluntarily became weak by human standards so that he could demonstrate the strength that comes through humility. Jesus rejected violence so that he could show us the power of love. As Mary Hinkle Shore says, in this context, Christ crucified is not what Paul sees, but how Paul sees. What would it be like if we looked at the world through cross-shaped lenses. Baptist pastor H. Stephen Shoemaker tells about a ministry of the congregation he served in Fort Worth. On Thursdays, he writes, they throw open the fellowship hall to the homeless of the city and invite them into an agape meal. 200 or so attend every week. We sit down with them eat a family-style meal together. There are tablecloths, cut flowers, platters of delicious food with identifiable meats. <laughs> but the most crucial and most wonderful thing is that over the years, the church and the homeless people of Fort Worth have become friends. 
The ministry got off to a rocky start all those years ago. People living on the streets were justifiably skeptical. And because there were more of us than them, a little intimidated. These days, however, he says, the hall fills with people of diverse ethnicities and ages, all eating together, church and community. One guest said, we know the food is good because you sit down and eat it with us. After the meal, we worship around the tables. Fair warning is given, and only about half of the people leave before the song. After worship, we offer communion in the chapel next door. About 15 people come. Some weep as they walk down the aisle. They thought they'd never take communion again. When you lose your home, you often lose your access to the sacraments. The ministry just keeps going, never seeming to be short of funding. But the greater miracle, he says, is the lives of the people who have joined in this gathering and the friendships begun. The schizophrenic woman trying to stay safe and on her meds says that this night gets her to the next Thursday night because here she feels beloved and treasured. Wayne, an older man who lived behind the pizza hut and kept warm in the electric blanket that the manager let him hook up on cold nights. A young girl who lives in a cheap motel with her mother comes every year for her birthday meal. A talented African-American man who has led our singing on Thursday, battled through several seasons of recovery and relapse with chemical addictions, now married and a new father. Then there's Mary, who would not speak a word or look at a person when she first came. But last spring, she spoke before our entire congregation of 700. And a man called Tree, a huge lumberjack of a man with a bushy black beard and bandana and a voice that sounds like a giant tree is splitting down the middle, who gives thanks for the head dude the unseen provider for the meal. And then there was a young teen who was so touched by the tenderness and love that she went to a phone and called her mother and said, Mom, I'm coming home. Stephen says one Thursday, a middle-aged Hispanic man came down for communion. After I served him, he made the sign of the cross, tears streaming down his face. Afterwards, I said rather glibly, come back next week, the food's always good. And he stopped me. The food's not why I come. And he just nodded toward the fellowship hall. That's why I come, pointing to the bread and the wine. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, Paul wrote. Now that I think about it, I believe the reason that Paul downplays his oratorical skills here is not because of humility. He doesn't do it to diminish himself. It's because he didn't want the messenger to outshine the message. He didn't want people to follow Jesus because they had been persuaded with a lot of smooth talk or wowed by an entertaining multimedia presentation. He's not looking to get people all fired up with the fleeting emotional high that will dissipate at the first sign of trouble. That missed the point and would diminish the sacrifice of Jesus. No, the cross is nothing less than the power of God unto salvation. It's the cross that announces that the old order of injustice and control and enmity is passing away and the new order of God's reign on earth has begun. It's the cross that reminds us that God is still very much at work, healing our brokenness and reconciling us to God and to each other. It's the cross that draws us together, that will connect us to our higher calling and that will fill our lives with meaning and hope. Amen.